you are never able to escape your heart. So it's better to just listen to what it says. This may hold a different meaning for people outside this room, but for all of us, it has a more applicable meaning. Hypertension is leading yet most neglected cause of cardiac ailments. When we stop hearing what a heart has to say, a heart just stops. Let's hear from learned people about hypertension, current concepts in management at third Dr. Mahindra P. Sambi Arishi. Today, we have with us Dr. Sunil Nadar. Now, I request our Vice Principal Dr. G.S. Wander to introduce Dr. Mohinder P. P. Sambi Arishi. So, uh, at the outset, I must thank uh, Dr. Kaushal, Dr. Sandeep Puri, our principal, and all of you uh, students for having allowed us to merge the Dr. Mahinder P. Sambi oration with, uh, with the NUMCON. One could realize that there are, there are going to be so many young hearts here, and it's better to talk about hypertension, which affects one-fourth of the world population. Uh, they say the world population today is about 7.5 billion and we believe that about 1.5 billion people have hypertension. So we are going to talk about a disease which afflicts uh, one in four people beyond 30 years of age. And that's what you're going to uh, look at managing. Besides stress being one of the major factors, hypertension related to that also afflicts. And we are lucky to have uh, this gentleman, uh, Dr. Mahinder P. Sambi, who was, a, uh, he, he was born in Ludhiana in uh, 1926 and then he went on to US to practice medicine there. He was a hypertension expert and uh, he practiced there with his wife Mino to whom he was very deeply attached. Uh, in fact his father had worked in Dehran Medical College and he as a great gentleman that he was very quiet, balanced, dignified man who never advertised himself for what he did. Uh, of course he loved the work that he did and he did enormous research in the field of hypertension uh, his wife uh, died in 2004 and he lived on for another 11 years after that and he contributed a lot of uh, charitable philanthropic activities subsequent to the, his wife Mino's um, demise and the last 12-13 years he devoted towards philanthropy. Of course he was practicing medicine and managing patients of hypertension. In 2015, a couple of months before uh, he himself died, he contributed a very large amount of money to this institution to start the Mohinder P. Sambi Hypertension uh, Chair and Clinic, which we are um, running in this institution very proudly. We are doing enormous research on hypertension in the memory of this gentleman. He, in fact, in, his, in the memory of his wife, Minno, he started these philanthropic activities and he started the program of Indian studies. He, do, he donated to the John Hopkins University, Washington, a very large amount. He started a chair, as Dr. Sain was also saying, some extracurricular uh, interests besides medicine. And he was very fond of popularizing Indian music in the US. And he started this chair in University of California, Los Angeles. He developed a Navgraha temple in Las Vegas in the memory of his wife, Melo. So he did. Uh, contribute enormously and we in this institution hold an yearly uh, oration in his memory. He will continue to be an inspiration for all of us and I am very thankful to Dr. Sunil Nadar who is an expert in hypertension, uh, in heart disorders, uh, to speak to you, the young hearts about how best, uh, what is the perspective as to how we have reached the present stage of knowledge in terms of hypertension management and where do we stand today. I will request our worthy principal, uh, Dr. Sandeep Puri, to just introduce the um, speaker for today's uh, Mahindra P. Sambi oration. Thank you, sir. I am indeed uh, thankful to Professor Wander for having uh, included this oration at uh, NAMCON uh, 2019. After this uh, wonderful uh, lecture on how to go about stress from Dr. Amit Sain, uh, we move on to this oration. At, uh, it's my honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Sunil Nadar. Uh, he's the editor of the Journal of Human Hypertension, and he's a senior consultant cardiologist at uh, Muscat in Oman. Dr. Sunil did his MBBS and his MD from Christian Medical College at Vellore. He co-edited a book on hypertension with Professor Gregory Lip. 
He has been listed on Google Scholar as one of the top 10 researchers in Oman in the year 2016. He was previously a consultant cardiologist with the Heart of England NHS Trust and an honorary senior lecturer with the University of Birmingham at UK. His main research interests are platelet activation, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and coronary intervention. I'm very pleased, sir, and honored and privileged to have you with us today to deliver the Mohinder P. Zambi oration. May I request Dr. Sunil Nazar to come and deliver the oration? Dr. Sunil, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just want to thank um, the organizers of this uh, wonderful conference. I want to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Wanda, uh, Dr. Puri, for giving me this uh, honor and opportunity and privilege, really, to present the uh, Mohinder P. Sambi oration. It's indeed really a, a great honor to do this. I also want to say that um, the organizers were probably quite clever scheduling the talk on stress management just before the talk on hypertension and after that wonderful talk I hope you have some tips and tricks to uh, deal with this one hour talk on hypertension. Anyway, so I'll start with uh, probably just giving you a bit of historical perspectives about hypertension. Uh, then we'll talk about the diagnosis of hypertension, a bit about uh, how we deal with target organ damage, uh, the treatment targets, how to improve compliance and I'll end with the Indian perspective. So as this is a medical student uh, conference, I thought I'll give you a bit of history, just not to bore you, but to actually to tell you how things have changed, how things have evolved in the field of hypertension. I think you all know that Stephen Hales, who in uh, 1733 first demonstrated the blood pressure of a horse. What he did at that time was he connected a blood view to uh, the carotid artery of the horse, which of course the horse was tied down. If it was still standing, it probably would have kicked him. So he got his uh, worthy assistant to tie the horse down. And they connected this tube and they saw the blood rise all the way up in the tube. And they also noticed, they were probably the first to notice that the blood pressure, as they uh, discussed it, did not come back down to the, uh, to the level of the horse. But that actually, in between the fluctuations, it still remained high. And that's when they realized that there is a constant force or a constant pressure in the circulation of the animal. Uh, Jean Poissel in 1828 uh, first, discovered, first invented the mercury uh, manometer. That's not really the thing. Uh, what he did was he connected the, uh, a rubber tubing to the artery and connected to this U-shaped mercury uh, manometer, which then looked at the difference in blood pressure between the two arms. And Carl Ludwig in 1847 then connected it to a tracing, and which he called the cartograph, which gave a manual tracing of the blood pressure. Uh, I think most students know that it was River Rochi in 1897 who first, uh, who's credited with the first uh, pneumatics figure manometer that we use today. But it was Samuel Seifert, Carl Ritter, who in 1881 first introduced a non-invasive uh, sphinx. But here he used a different technique where they looked at the pressure required to compress the artery. And of course we all know Korotkov who discussed, who discovered or rather uh, introduced the concept of the Korotkov sounds and this is how, this is what we use today. However, with the, discover, with the discovery of these uh, different methods to check blood pressure, there was still a lot of confusion about what to do with this blood pressure. I mean, people didn't know, is this abnormal, what is normal, what are the levels that we need to treat, what should we need to do. And in fact, they found that a lot of sick patients, or patients who had uh, many conditions, patients with stroke, patients who had heart attacks, who actually had high blood pressure, and they, uh, they thought that this high blood pressure is actually a compensatory mechanism that's keeping the body alive, that's maintaining perfusion to these different organs. And that's why we came up with the term essential hypertension. I'm sure most of you students would have heard of that, but you always wondered why is it essential. And that's really the uh, origin of the term, because it was considered to be essential, it was considered to be important in order to maintain perfusion to the different organs. And even before Twitter and uh, Facebook and Instagram and so on, you still had people who put forth their 
views on different things. Of course, in those days it was done through the medical journals, it was done through newspapers. And here we have in 1937 by Paul Dudley White, uh, who was President Eisenhower's personal physician. So you can see even in those days people from the White House did have strong views on different things. And he said hypertension may be an important compensatory mechanism which should not be tampered with, even if it was certain that we could control it. So he said this is something that, you know, and this was the prevalent thinking in those days that hypertension or high blood pressure was essential and that we should not do anything uh, to try to control it. Another famous person of the day, J.H. Uh, Hay, who was another famous physician, he said the greatest danger to a man with high blood pressure lies in its discovery because then some fool is certain to try and reduce it. So they were so against trying to control blood pressure because they felt it was essential. This is what kept the patient alive. Like today, even in those days, all you needed was a celebrity or somebody famous to make a disease popular. And here we have the president himself, President Franklin Roosevelt, who was the 32nd American president, who was documented to have high blood pressure. In fact, his blood pressure at some points were recorded to be 200 and 20 over 130 millimeters of mercury. And he was told on numerous occasions that this is normal and that nothing needs to be done. But towards the end of his presidency, they noticed that uh, he was getting forgetful, he was getting headaches, he was not always with it. And so what did they do? They prescribed him some sedatives, they gave him some massages, which they thought that you know, he's, he's just stressed, probably didn't have the opportunity to listen to that wonderful talk he just heard, didn't know how to control his stress. And he felt that this was all that was required. Um, in fact, when he met, uh, during the Second World War, when he met uh, um, Prime Minister Winston Churchill's uh, private physician at one of the meetings, the private physician actually said, uh, commented on President Roosevelt that something is not quite right. He looks tired, he looks worn out, and his arteries are hardened. And in fact, that uh, physician, in a personal letter to uh, uh, President to Prime Minister Churchill actually said, I don't think this man is going to survive more than six months. And in fact, he died a few months later after that meeting due to a massive cerebral hemorrhage. And as I said, all you need is a celebrity or a famous person to have something and then you have this interest in that disease. And likewise, because of this, they realized that maybe that high blood pressure wasn't a good thing after all. And the next president, uh, President Truman in 1948 signed the National Heart Act to facilitate research into cardiovascular disease and hypertension, and that's the beginning of the famous National Heart Institute, which of course now has become the National Heart, Blood and Lung Institute. Now you would have heard of this institute because they were responsible for the famous Framingham study, and all the other major uh, trials that have come have been led by the NHL, or the NHLDI as it is now called. Um, so things did start to change, and in fact, this is a, a quote from the first edition of Harrison's textbook of medicine. And no, I did not look at it. I have not had the opportunity to read it when it was first out. It's not that old, but it does say that the, high, the treatment of hypertension should be based on symptoms of ordinary difficulties. Those with chest pain or other overt signs of disease should have their hypertension treated. Others should not. So this was the first time. Uh, that people actually said that maybe high blood pressure is not a good thing and that we need to start treating it. But again, they singled out a particular group of people and they said that it's only those who have symptoms suggestive of coronary artery disease, these are the ones who need to be treated for hypertension. So then, of course, uh, just look at the timeline of how things evolved. Uh, in the late 1960s, we had the Framingham Heart Study and the Veterans Administration Study which suggested, again, for the first time that high blood pressure may be implicated in cardiovascular disease. In 1972, you had the National High Blood Pressure Education Program, which started educating people about the need to reduce blood pressure. And in 1977, for the first time, the JNC-1 suggested that all patients with a blood pressure of, one, of greater than 160 millimeters of mercury should be treated with medications. Uh, then, of course, we've got a lot of studies that came on. Uh, the more important ones that I've put here, uh, of course, that was a, a VA study in 1967. Then you had the Mr. Fitton in uh, 1982, the UK PDS in 2002, 
we as got out and we all had studies were again studies that looked at different treatment algorithms which helped uh, really guide our current thinking of the management algorithms of hypertension. And of course we have the SPRINT trial which came out just a few years ago which is quite controversial and I will talk a bit about that. So really in 2019, what are our thoughts about hypertension? What are the current concepts? How do we deal with the patient with hypertension? So at present, we realize that hypertension is a complex condition, that it's, and it's just way beyond just the blood pressure. It's way beyond just those numbers that you hear. It's way beyond 220 over 110, or 120 over 80, uh, because it affects almost every organ in the body. We now have much lower treatment and uh, targets and treatment thresholds. Because if you remember, in 1977, they spoke about 160, but now we have much lower targets. We've also realized that uh, early diagnosis and management is important, and that we need to prevent and screen, just like how we do for diabetes, we need to do that for high blood pressure as well. So, I'm not going to go into this complicated slide, but it just tells you the different ways in which hypertension affects almost every organ of the body. Uh, you can see here that it causes uh, platelet activation, it causes endothelial dysfunction, it causes uh, changes in the enzymes that are responsible for fibrosis, it causes uh, increased collagen deposition, it causes, uh, it changes your uh, the bleeding cascade, and so on. And that leads to both the microscopic and the macroscopic complications that you get with hypertension. Now, we have what we call a multifaceted approach to hypertension. It's as I said, it's no longer just treating the blood pressure, treating the numbers that you see. So the first thing is, of course, the diagnosis of hypertension. Um, then you need to identify any secondary cause of hypertension. You then need to screen for target organ damage. You need to advise lifestyle changes. We need to institute drug therapy. But at the center of all this, that in the middle of all this, that the main reason that we're doing all this is to lower the cardiovascular risk. Because that is the ultimate aim, the ultimate goal of treating a patient who's got high blood pressure. Um, we'll start with the diagnosis of hypertension. And the American Society of Hypertension, the AC, American College of Cardiology, or all of the groups together came out in 2017 with the new guidelines. And for those of you who've been following it, it caused a lot of stir in the medical literature because there were many people who were against it. What they said for the first time was that a normal blood pressure, a normal blood pressure is that below, uh, is that below 120. Between 120 to 129, they said is high, is elevated. But they di they diagnosed hypertension, or rather they suggested that hypertension be diagnosed if the blood pressure is greater than 130 millimeters of mercury. And they just said that they just gave, gave it a grade uh, stage one and stage two hypertension. The European guidelines, which came a year later, did not change much from the previous European guidelines, which where your cutoffs are about 10 millimeters of mercury more than the American guidelines. So here, what they've said is uh, the normal blood pressure is between 120 to 129. High normal is 130 to 139. But hypertension really starts only with a cutoff of 140. Right? Uh, so anything below that really is still considered high normal or normal. But similar to the American guidelines, they did say that the optimal reading is less than 120. Now the reason the American guidelines uh, gave such a low reading was because of this study called the SPRINT trial, where they found that if the blood pressure was lowered as low as possible or as close to 120 as possible, the rates of complications such as strokes and heart attacks were much, much lower. It was significantly lower when they had intensive treatment where the blood pressure was below 120. Um, and according to the new classification, or according to the new cutoffs, the American guidelines themselves have quoted that if you use the American guidelines, you would say that the incidence of hypertension is about 32%. But whereas if you use the new guidelines, the, uh, uh, the new American guidelines, almost half the population above the age of uh, uh, 20 would be considered to be hypertensive. So this is a major shift in the way we think and in the way uh, we deal with high blood pressure. 
Uh, there were a few caveats though in this because in the sprint study, most of the patients had unattended home monitoring and where they had to check the blood pressure themselves. Or they also had what we call an ambulatory blood pressure monitor where patients wore a blood pressure monitor for 24 hours. And it has also been shown that these readings are generally 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury lower than office readings. And this is again just a comparison, a study which compared readings taken at home as well as uh, clinic, uh, the clinic readings. And you find that especially in the higher groups, uh, the 24 hour, 24 hour average is almost 15 millimeters of mercury less than what you get uh, in the office. The new guidelines and the new way of thinking also puts much more emphasis on home monitoring, on the use of 24 hour blood pressure monitors, because these are more useful in um, uh, in ruling out things like white coat hypertension, mask hypertension, and there is more emphasis on uh, being reliant on these automated blood pressure monitors. Because I was speaking to Dr. Maharaj just some time ago where he said that there was a new study which showed that almost one in, uh, sorry, almost 90% of physicians in the US don't know how to take the blood pressure the proper way. Because if you go according to the guidelines, the blood pressure ought to be taken with the patient seated for at least five minutes without him talking to anyone. His legs should not be crossed. The uh, arm should be at the level of the cup. Uh, he should not have had coffee or smoked, uh, smoked a cigarette for at least two hours prior to that. And there are so many other things which, uh, uh, which are recommended as the ideal way to take a blood pressure. But we know that in a, a busy clinic, we don't do that. The patient just walks in. Quite often, you have just stood for 20 minutes waiting to be registered. He just comes in. Already, he's angry. He's stressed that he's waited so long. He walks into your room, and you put the blood pressure cuff on. It shows the blood pressure reading of 180 over 90, and you think he's hypertensive. But all that, that high blood pressure reflects is just this frustration at having to have to wait so long waiting because it would just get you on time and so on. So it's very important that we rely on home blood pressure readings and also use 24 hour blood pressure monitoring a bit more. So if we were to use uh, these home monitorings and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, the thresholds now for classifying hypertension might be slightly lower, where if you can see here that uh, the home blood pressure average is actually 130, which is similar to what the Americans have said. And the mean home blood pressure reading also 135 millimeters of mercury. Um, the next part of the management of hypertension is identifying secondary causes of hypertension. I won't go into details because each one of these causes are quite a uh, uh, talk on its own. But it's very important to remember that, especially in young hypertensives, patients with resistant hypertension or malignant hypertension, we need to rule out secondary causes of hypertension and we need to uh, do the basic tests for that. The next important aspect of uh, managing hypertension is to look for target organ damage. And again, I won't go through the details of all of these, but I will go in a bit of detail of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy because this is an area of uh, interest for me. Uh, LVH is probably one of the common early manifestations of hypertension. It's easily diagnosed on ECG, on echo, on MRI, and it has been shown to be an independent predictor of cardiovascular events. Now, uh, and also studies have shown that with regression of LVH after treatment, uh, and, uh, that correlates quite well with prognosis. So LVH, what it does, it causes diastolic dysfunction, it causes systolic dysfunction, it leads to atrial fibrillation, it causes microvascular ischemia, and it also causes arrhythmias. And LVH on its own also, what it does, because of increasing uh, LV diastolic filling pressure, it causes the left atrial size to increase, it causes atrial fibrosis, slows down atrial conduction, and that causes atrial fibrillation. And as you know, atrial fibrillation is a major risk factor for strokes. And this study here just shows how patients with hyper, uh, LVH, sorry, have much greater complications as compared to hypertensives who do not have uh, any left ventricular hypertrophy. And similarly, uh, when they followed up patients on treatment, uh, those who had, who never had LVH, or those whose LVH regressed with treatment, 
they had less uh, complications as compared to those who never had any LVH regression or those who developed LVH for the first time on treatment. And similarly, uh, this is both on uh, ECHO and on ECG. Similarly, when you look at the two groups here, uh, this group had never had LVH, this group had uh, the LVH regressed with treatment, this group had no LVH regression, and this group actually had new LVH during their treatment. And they found that those who never had LVH did far better than those who developed new LVH during their treatment. So it is definitely an important risk factor, and all patients with hypertension should be screened for this and should have it as part of their regular follow -up. Um, they've also shown that different classes of drugs have different effects on left ventricular hypertrophy <coughs> with uh, the angiotensin receptor blockers showing far greater repression of LVH as compared to heat blockers and diuretics. And this again is part of the reason why in the guidelines we tend to use uh, ARBs and ACE inhibitors much earlier than the other uh, agents. The other uh, target organ damage that uh, we need to look for is uh, vascular disease. <coughs> now there are different ways in which we can look for uh, vascular disease and that is uh, flow mediated vasodilatation. We can look at the uh, carotid intima media thickness, the pulse wave velocity and also the ankle brachial index. These all look at different ways in which the uh, vasculature has been thickened, has been hardened and uh, they give an idea of uh, uh, the involvement of the vasculature. However, it's not recommended that these are done as a routine. And again, looking at the different target organ damages that can be used for monitoring therapy, we find that LVH is probably the best because it has prognostic use. None of the others really have any prognostic use, but they tell us that uh, uh, they, they give us an idea of the severity of the hypertension, of the long-standing uh, uh, nature of the disease, and whether we need to be monitoring them much more. The next part of uh, hypertension management is assessment of cardiovascular risk. Now, the European guidelines talk about the score system, while the Americans talk about the uh, ASCVD risk system. Again, there are various uh, factors which are involved here, which get taken into uh, consideration, you have the age, you have the gender, smoking, cholesterol, uric acid, um, there are many factors which of course increase cardiovascular risk in hypertensive patients and I think most of you would be aware of these kind of pictures where we look at uh, the uh, risk and the risk of cardiovascular events in these patients depending on whether they are male, female, whether they smoke, based on the age, based on the cholesterol levels. And you find that, for example, a male smoker at the age of 60, he's at almost a 47% risk of uh, having a cardiovascular event in 10 years. Uh, this again is a different way of looking at the same uh, risk function. Now, we must remember that uh, not everyone has got the same cardiovascular risk. And in fact, there is a multiplication factor and South Asians have almost a 40% higher risk. So whatever risk you get by using these risk factors, you have to increase it by 40% in uh, Indians, uh, people from South Asia. Now, what are the treatment thresholds? Now, we saw what the treatment, um, how we define hypertension, but when do we actually start treatment? The ESC has made it very simple. You just treat everybody who's got a blood pressure above 140, whether they've got diabetes or chronic muscular, uh, sorry, or chronic kidney disease or previous stroke. Because the previous guidelines used to have different thresholds for different um, categories of patients, but now they have simplified it and they've just uh, given a, a threshold of 140, apart from the very elderly. So those above 80 years, you would probably wait till they reach the blood pressure of 160. Um, the American guidelines again have simplified most of their thresholds as well, but they've used a much lower threshold of 130 over 90 millimeters mercury before initiation of treatment. Um, now, once you start treatment, well, how low would you want them to go? To, would you want their blood pressure to go? Now, the ESC has suggested that you bring it down to 130 millimeters of mercury, but they've said very clearly, but not less than 120. 
So some of you may have heard of this thing called the J curve, uh, the management of hypertension, where once you reach that cutoff, your the, the complications or the side effects of medications probably outweigh any potential benefits that you would get by lowering the blood pressure. And again, uh, uh, the target in most cases, if you find, if you look, it's all you try to bring it to at least 130. It's only over here in the middle-aged patients with chronic renal disease that you would want it to be a little higher. Right, so our new concept really is that uh, these thresholds are now easier to remember. You've got lower target values, uh, including the elderly patients. There's greater emphasis on assessing the overall cardiovascular risk. And age is not really a barrier to treatment, and emphasis should be given to the physical age of the patient rather than the chronological age. Because there may be 80 year olds who are still running marathons, who are trying to skydive, etc. And so you would probably try to treat these patients a bit more aggressively. The, coming towards the end, where uh, one of the major changes again in management is uh, lifestyle changes. And all the guidelines now place considerable importance on lifestyle changes in patients with hypertension. And it's also emphasized that these changes are started both before and during uh, pharmacological treatment of hypertension. Now, what are these? One is to maintain a BMI between 21 to 25, um, and to maintain a weight circumference of 94 centimeters in men and 80 centimeters in women. And that is considered to be a very important uh, part of managing hypertension. The Mediterranean diet, there's again a lot of emphasis on the diet. One of the things is the so-called Mediterranean diet, which includes a lot of vegetables and fruits, uh, the use of olive oil, and maybe less meat. Uh, there's also the lot of importance on restricting salt in the diet to about 5 grams of salt a day. Now, in today's world, we live on, you know, it's a fast-paced life. There's a lot of fast food that's eaten, and Everything has got salt in it. There's a lot of hidden salt in practically everything that we eat. And we find that a lot of studies have shown that the average salt consumption is of actually about 10 grams per day in most places. And so to try to bring it down to 5 grams a day it would take considerable effort. The other thing with the diet also is to probably include more bananas in your, in your diet because bananas have high potassium and that helps to reduce the salt of the diet. Uh, there's also studies that show that uh, consumption of beetroot juice tends to reduce blood pressure. Uh, exercise is important, and about 150 minutes of strenuous exercise or 300 minutes of moderate exercise a week has been shown to reduce cardiovascular risk. Uh, for those who consume alcohol, again, and now remember that these, this is for patients who already have hypertension. They say that only 14 units a week for men and 8 units a week for women uh, is probably the recommended. Of course, for those who don't have hypertension, the limits are much higher. It's about 23 units for men and 18 units for women. Now, just to put it in perspective, a pint of beer or a shot of whiskey has one unit. So that's still a fair amount. But remember, it says that it's over a week. And again, it says that this is just the upper limit. It doesn't say that you have to have this a week. Right, so bear that in mind. So coming to the drug therapy, uh, one of the new concepts now in drug therapy is the use of combination pills. For, for us, when we were medical students, we were taught that combination pills are bad. You don't combine pills, you need to um, take these drugs individually. And there was not much good reasoning behind this apart from the fact that people were told that um, you know, these are not flexible, but you have to fix drug combination, you can't manipulate the drugs, and so these were bad. And this is what we grew up thinking, and so this is what we were taught when we were undergraduate. But now the concept of, is moving more towards the use of combination pills, more because it helps with uh, compliance. We find that patients who've got heart disease, they end up having multiple uh, drugs. And so by having combination drugs, you actually improve the compliance. And so here again, I won't go into the details, but they say to start with the antitensin blockers, and then you add the uh, calcium channel blockers or the diuretic, and then you go to a triple combination as the next therapy. And of course, if patients then have resistant hypertension, you add 
more specialized drugs such as fibrolactone or so on. And at that stage, you would have to refer them to a specialist center. Uh, concomitant therapy. Now, statins are not recommended in patients who are at low risk. If you remember, we did that uh, risk calculation. And so for those who are at low risk, you do not give them statins. But all other patients may benefit from statins. Um, and also you would have to target uh, to a very low LDL level. Uh, aspirin is not recommended in primary prevention of hypertension. So a person who has hypertension, just hypertension on its own, you would not start aspirin on them unless they've had a heart attack or a stroke. Now, this is something again that probably the newer generation would be more interested in, in how to improve compliance. Because this is something else that again, a lot of emphasis is being placed on. Um, one is a team-based approach where we involve a multidisciplinary team, where there's an increased role for pharmacists, for community nurses, for specialist nurses, um, to help improve compliance. Because doctors on their own are not good at trying to motivate patients to uh, comply with their drugs. Doctors just don't have the time to do it. Whereas nurses and pharmacists and community uh, healthcare workers are probably able to engage much better with patients and to monitor their compliance. Technology uh, in terms of apps is something that is being tried quite a lot. Uh, there are many apps where patients can note their blood pressure, it reminds them to take their blood pressure, it tells them how to take their blood pressure, and these apps have been found to be very useful in uh, controlling blood pressure and also in controlling compliance. Because patients are reminded through their apps that you haven't checked your blood pressure, you haven't taken your tablet today, and they, uh, studies have shown repeatedly that these are very good at improving compliance and also at improving blood pressure. Telemedicine is something else that uh, has been used recently, where patients can remotely send their blood pressure readings from the home readings to the physician or to the specialist nurse, who would then keep an eye on this and would be able to advise whether they need to improve their, uh, whether they need to take their tablets more, whether they need to improve their compliance. Social media is something else, where you have different groups of like-minded people who share their blood pressure together, they talk about their difficulties in maintaining blood pressure. Because one of the things we need to remember for patients with hypertension is that a lot of them are asymptomatic. Most hypertensive patients are asymptomatic and the first time that patients realize they've got high blood pressure is when they come in with a heart attack or with a stroke. In fact, hypertension has been called a silent killer. Some of you have heard that term uh, because patients don't have hypertension. And then you give them all these drugs to treat the hypertension, which ends up causing side effects. They become dizzy, they uh, start falling, they become lightheaded. And a lot of patients stop it, thinking that I've been well, why do I need to take these tablets that make me feel unwell? And all these different support mechanisms, like social media, social networks, actually help patients to overcome these side effects and to persevere with continuing with their medication. So, uh, uh, the last few slides, which you please to know, uh, is just on the Indian perspective of uh, managing hypertension and where we stand on this. Now, these treatment guidelines, people usually tell me that all these guidelines are for the West, they're not for Indian population, but studies have shown that these same treatment targets are still valid here, the same treatment thresholds are valid here as well. And in fact, the Indian patients, as I've shown you, the Indian population, are at higher cardiovascular risk. So it's even more important that we try to control hypertension here, that we try to maintain the strict levels that we've, uh, that are uh, recommended by the guidelines. Now, in India uh, and in other similar countries, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, home monitoring may not be feasible everywhere, especially in the rural areas. Uh, so it's very important to educate patients and to make them aware of hypertension and to make them aware of the possible side effects, the process of complications of hypertension. And therefore early initiation of treatment is very important. Now mass screening programs that have been carried on, especially uh, some of you may have heard of the May Measurement Month, uh, which we were a part, where we take the screening to the population, where healthcare workers are uh, educated on how to take measurements and they go up into the population and screen those
the population for blood pressure. These, these have been shown to pick up a high number of hypertension patients, people who did not know that they had hypertension previously. So, in conclusion, uh, I'd like to say that uh, hypertension is no longer considered a benign entity, but it's an important cardiovascular risk factor. The overall cardiovascular risk is important when assessing a hypertensive patient. Early recognition and treatment is important. It's very important to screen for target organ damage and to monitor these because they help uh, assess the prognosis. We need to remember the new blood pressure thresholds. We need to use more ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. We need to rely on patients measuring the blood pressure. We need to give the ownership back to the patient to maintain and to look after their blood pressure. Lifestyle changes are very important and it should be started early. Uh, combination therapy, is, which previously was frowned upon, is now recognized and is considered to be useful. Technology can help us change the way we manage patients and especially with the younger generation who are more tech savvy, who know how to use these things more, who are more reliant on using their smartphones and smartphones for these things. I think we need to encourage this more uh, and make the patient more involved in their uh, management. And of course, mass screening programs and outreach programs are very important, uh, especially in countries where access to healthcare is probably limited. Thank you for your attention. Like, thank you so much, sir, for enlightening us. Now, I request Secretary, sir, to facilitate our esteemed speaker, Dr. Sunil Nada, with a token of luck, positivity, and prosperity.